Coming up this Saturday on Beyond the Vibe, I'm joined by the three-time number one chart-topping artist, Anthony Gomes. Here is the treasured photo. Wow. TV King, taken by Robert Wren. <laughs> That's crazy. Of course, this album guests uh, Billy Sheehan of the Wiry Dogs and Mr. Big and uh, Ray Luzier of uh, Corn. Hey man, when I was growing up, everybody said the baddest rock bass player was Billy Sheehan. It's like, <laughs> you know, you didn't want to meet that guy in a dark alley. <laughs> People have been your two rock for me, for your two blues for rock, and uh, because I'm I prior to this album, I've been marketed in the blues genre. There's always been this idea to water it down or don't do finger tapping on the guitar because that technique is so blatantly rock, and um, it's just been such a struggle. And finally, on high voltage blues, I said, you know. I'm just going to be 100% myself, but I've been dying to answer this question and nobody's ever asked. So I'm here with uh, Anthony Gomes. Thank you very much for joining me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having, having me on your show. (laughs) um i think to really get a picture of somebody you have to kind of look at how things began for them um so what first got you into wanting to become a musician um i think it's something that chooses you Mm. you don't really choose being a musician i mean there's a really romanticized version of what a musician is and in reality it's (laughs) a lot of sleeping on couches and you know, eating bad food and making uh, incredible financial sacrifices and investments. You know, um, we're celebrating the 21st anniversary of one of our first albums. And it cost $30,000 to make that album. I mean, people buy a house, you know, and start a life with that. And as a musician, uh, you're like, hey, let's spend this ridiculous amount of money and hope we might break even <clears throat> at some point. So I uh, get back to your question. You just, you're there and you're a servant of the music and you are so compelled to do it that mm-hmm. you have no other choice but to walk through this, you know, walkway of fire and you just cross <laughs> it and you do it and, and you hope for the best, man. I think that's what it is, but it's in your blood and there's no turning back. There's no diverting that course straight ahead, you know. Mm. I, th- I think for some people they they've always just gravitate i mean i've heard in the past you know s- sometimes they get it through their parents you know their parents are a musician so it's like a family thing um yeah. you know various ways i mean i think growing up everybody has that that first artist or musician that they really connect with did you have one in particular i mean i can hear in your work many different influences uh, um well, when I was six, I bought Kiss Alive and Elvis Aloha from Hawaii. Wow. Um, and that's that's a combination. Of, <laughs> that's a combination. <laughs> like, that's what's great about being six. You, you listen without prejudice, right? I mean, you don't know what's cool or what's not. I didn't realize Kiss was, you know, breathing fire or whatever. I just saw this album cover and, um, you know, it was a hot band at the time. So, uh and, you know, so, but I really resonated with, with the blues aspect of both those things, especially mm-hmm. Elvis. And uh, I would say probably when I was 10, I got back in black, 10 or 11. And I remember that was such a moving experience, you know, and, and it still remains one of my favorite albums today. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, it sold 55 million copies in the United States. And I think I'm responsible for about 10 because I've wore them out. You know, every sort of fashion, cassette, CD, vinyl. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you know, I, I always like things that were powerful in their delivery, mm -hmm. but soulful. There was a, there was a this mixture of, and you know, I even listen to gospel music because I feel it's very powerful, um, and soulful. So, uh, but yeah, I, I've always gravitated towards the rock. Mm. I mean, I can hear in your work throughout uh, all of your albums, there's always this kind of, you know, some some tracks are more bluesy, some tracks are more kind of rocky. Um, have, have you always kind of wanted to just, you know, like some people that go, oh, you've got to choose, you've got to pick one. Wow. Uh, have you always kind of been like, I'm not doing that, I'm just going to do what feels right? What a tremendous question, and nobody has ever asked me this. Um <laughs> Look, I've made 14 albums, and finally, on my 14th album, I decided not to ask that question, because um, I'm sort of a blues rock artist. I love, I have an equal love for John Lee Hooker as I do for Ghost or whatever. Like, I, I mean, I, I, I love both of these things, and I find they're interchangeable. Um as far as my understanding of music and my appreciation of it. But my whole career, people have been, you're too rock for blues, or you're too blues for rock. And uh, because I'm, I, prior to this album, I've been marketed in the blues genre, there's always been this idea to water it down or don't do finger tapping on the guitar because that technique is so blatantly rock. And um, it's just been such a struggle. And, Finally, on High Voltage Blues, I said, you know, I'm just going to be 100% myself, probably upset a lot of people, the gatekeepers and the tastemakers, which I think I may have. Um, maybe, I, you know, I won't be invited on blues festivals because, you know, my, my sound is an abomination of all things sacred. And, uh, you know, you got to deal with this crap. And. I just went ahead. I was as honest as I could be. And some of those things have happened, but all of a sudden fans are coming out of the woodwork and it's by far the most successful release I've ever had. Um, and in fact, people are, I've done some interviews with guitar magazines and they're like, Hey, you're sort of creating your own lane. You know, it's not exactly in the hard rock lane. It's not in the blues lane. It's your own thing. And. I think only recently I realized I'm, my mom's French Canadian and my dad's Portuguese. And I feel equally comfortable in my dad's community and my dad's heritage as I do my mom's. Um, you know, every Christmas we spend in Quebec City and everyone's speaking French and, you know, I'm hanging out with my dad's friends and family and they're telling me why Portugal is the greatest country in the world. <laughs> so, you know, and I feel a kinship to both of them, those things. But I am my own person. So it wasn't until I kind of realized that musically that um, I'm at this spot right now. So sorry for the very long answer, but I've been dying to answer this question and nobody's ever asked. No, I think I think it's great that, you, you know, why in this day and age do we have to choose what, you know, like why do we just have to do pure blues but i mean at the end of the day what is pure blues at this point what is pure rock yeah you know, you know I, I mean uh even the blues buddy guys always said there's no pure blues there's always mm -hmm. been a gumbo you know and the first blues song uh according to historical scholars originated in cleveland mississippi in 1895 what happened in 1894 I and mean, was there no music before that <laughs> you know so everything is evolving. You know, one of my favorite quotations is uh, every truth starts off as a heresy. Uh, and, you know, so, yeah, I think when rock and roll emerged, it was just uh, repackaged blues for a different audience. And um, after things evolved, they had all sorts of different bands. 
Well, it's no longer rock music. It's heavy rock. It's light rock. It's, you know, then it's heavy metal and then it's thrash metal and then it's black metal. And then you know, it, it, things are sort of evolving and people are trying to get a handle on what all of this is. But, uh, and, and it's a challenge sometimes, but I think, yeah, we shouldn't. I think once rock was established and then it started to splinter, everybody started to define it. And now with the internet and cross pollinization of influences, it's just a freak show. And I'm like, let's go. Let's <laughs> go with the freak show. I'm all for it. So, um, and uh, my mentor, BB King, always uh, resonates with me. And, and so many things he shared with me. And one was, he said, the blues are like the laws of the land. They have to be amended to the times we live in. Mm. Um, and uh, I mean, <laughs> take a brief pause. And, uh, that's so profound. So, yeah, I think that extends to all music um, mm. and, and all genres. And, yeah, I think we're in a great, beautiful time of living where um, we're sort of removing the shackles of label all things. Mm -hmm. And um, where this fun experiment takes us. Mm. Of course, you mentioned uh, a little bit there with BB King. I was when I was reading up on you for this interview. This this story in particular really struck me. Um, the the story of BB uh, King's bus driver was a, a jam night, and then you ending up on a tour with BB King for a series of dates. Hey, could yeah. you could you tell us a bit about this story? I mean, I read this and I was like, "Wow!" Like the chances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I'm in college, and I'm at the University of Toronto writing, uh, getting my master's degree. The only reason why I got my master's degree was to kill time. Mm. My parents were very conservative; they wanted me to get a real job. I I, I still was so scared about voyaging out into the unknown of being a musician. So that was my safety blanket. So I'd already got my bachelor's degree and stuff hadn't broken for me. So I'm like, well, I think I could milk another two years with this master's degree. And then I found out I could write my thesis on blues music. So I wrote my thesis on the racial and cultural evolution of blues music. In the 60s in particular, it started mm -hmm. off as predominantly African-American. And then 10 years later, it became integrated. And that fascinated me being uh, a Canadian blues wannabe artist, you know? So, um, and I just was reading about how amazing B.B. King was at reducing the barriers of blues and being such an incredible ambassador. And I was, he was my favorite artist and then he became one of my favorite human beings. So I go to this jam night. I'm broke. I'm in college, right? And if you jam, they give you a free beer. A free beer in college dollars equivalents is like a million dollars, right? You got no money, right? You, so, and if you were really hot, I mean, you were hot, you got two free beers. It gets you up a second time. And mm -hmm. this was on the set, it was a bit of a shady place, right? But it was the cool places. All good blues joints are there, a little shady. So I was having a two beer night. I was smoking and this guy comes up to me and said, who's your favorite guitar player? And you know, I, I could have said Jeff Beck, I could have said Jimi Hendrix. Um, I could have said B.B. King, I could have said Albert King, what, what a buddy guy, uh, Richie Blackmore, whatever. But I, I just looked at him, I said, you know, I remember even saying this, I go, that's easy, B.B. King. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I thought so. I'm his bus driver. And you have to put in context of where this place is, right? I mean, they were full of, uh, well, shysters, liars, you know, I mean, a very intoxicated people making up stories that, you know, I mean, this guy could have been the Pope or John F. Kennedy. I mean, it, so he said, I want you to meet Phoebe. We're in town tomorrow. And I'll give you four free tickets. Wow. And, and it was about an hour away. Um, so I called up my friends the next day and I said, Hey, do you want to go see BB King tonight? Maybe because we might be driving an hour out of our way. And it's not this guy was lying, but we show up front row tickets 
And at that time, you know, BB was in his late 60s, early 70s, and he was still standing up most of the show, and he was ferocious. And I'm thinking, I'm getting my butt kicked by a 70 year old man. This is embarrassing. <laughs> so I go backstage to meet him, and this was a pretty big deal. Like, I wore my Sunday best. I wore black dress trousers because BB always dressed up. I wore a white buttoned up shirt, real snazzy vest that I had. Um, I made business cards, like, you know, on the spot, Anthony Gomes, professional, uh, 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 blues guitarist, right? You know, I think back to that and I'm like, what professional would use the word professional as a term? <laughs> So I'm like, but I, 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 I was doing my best, right? <laughs> and his, his bus driver's name was Lamar Sanford. So I'm waiting to meet BB for 45 minutes because he has a table and he has a long line of people. Mm. He has two 8x10 promos. One's a headshot and one's a body shot. People come up to him. They introduce themselves, thank you for coming out, makes a little chit-chat, ask them which photo they like the best, and signs it to them and gives them. I mean, there were a hundred plus people, and Lamar told me that night that they have to lie to me and say, no, that's all. That's just the people that wanted to meet you. Otherwise, he would wait till five and six in the morning to meet everybody mm-hmm. and thank them. Like So... As a young, impressionable musician, I'm watching this going, this guy is the best, and he is this sincere and humble. And um, so Lamar introduced me to BB and said, oh, this is the young guy I told you about. And, um, and BB was just so great and so gracious. He took about 30 minutes with me, and he explained what it was like to be a band leader. Um, you're going to have your band one day. You're going to have to hire a musician. And, you know, here's something I've learned. You might find a a musician who's really good. And you may find a musician who's less good, but a really great person. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, a 70% musician, if you work with them, you can get them up to about 90%. But 70% of a person will always be 70% of a person. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so like, I'm just making this all. And I said, look, man, BB, I'm such a fan. Uh, not only of you as a player, but I know the things you've done to further the blues music. What an ambassador you've been. How, how you've tried to uh, erase the negative connotations of blues. How you've tried to uh, eliminate segregation within the music. How, You've been so thoughtful as to even where you perform so it's in, it allows everybody to be welcome, you know. And, you, you know, I, I think for someone who's done all that, to hear that that's recognized is a pretty moving for him. So everybody else, he signed his name and he thought for a second and he wrote, many thanks, B.B. King. And he said, you see what I wrote here? I mean this, many thanks. And so today, most of the time, I still write on my, if somebody writes to me, a fan, I still write many thanks because I feel like a connection to that in the tutelage that, that he gave me. Um, and then, yeah, uh, you know, uh, somewhere down the road, you know, a few years later, we start to make a name for ourselves and there we go. And he offers us a string of dates on, on a number of occasions. And, um, uh, probably the highlight of my life. Like just because I have so much respect for this person, so much love and admiration. Um and and to not be let down by your hero is such a great thing. And and to be welcome. Um and, and to be so vastly different from your hero in terms of uh race, uh, uh nationality, age. Experience and life, you, you know, all, all these things, and and just to feel right at home with somebody, with, uh, uh, a profound testament to you. The odds 
of that series of events happening to reach where you were at that point oh. it's it's quite extraordinary and the next day i i was doing well academically right you know and my parents i, I wanted to please my parents for whatever reason is i've gotten a little older i realized that you know you have to live your own life but for whatever reason in my early 20s i really wanted to please them and and you know get their blessing you know and i knew by being a professional musician i couldn't do that but the day after meeting bb king i thought if bb thinks i can do this then i can do it. and so i went to my dad and i said dad i want to be a professional musician <laughs> and you know <laughs> uh, he was trying to protect me, you know, but uh, he wasn't really initially open to the idea. But with time, he's been very, very supportive. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there's part two to this B.B. King story. Um, it, but it involves a little name dropping. Is that, is that, is that okay? All right, drop those names. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, about five years later, we're touring in Europe for the first time. Pretty mm. excited about that. And we're playing in help in Finland on the biggest blues festival they got there, right? And who's headlining? E.B. King. And there's like 10 names. And in the really small print on the bottom is, is our name, my name, right? So, but here we are, we're on a festival. The second name on the list is Robert Plant. Um, and his solo act. And we're staying in this hotel and I keep bumping into my neighbor in the hotel who so happens to be Robert Plant. And, you know, hey man, how's it going? Hey man, how's it going? So then we're hanging out in the backstage area and hey man, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? And wow, what a, another hero. Uh, and what a personable guy. What a great, like, and then at the time I was living in Chicago and oh my gosh, she's such a huge blues fan. I'm living in Chicago. He pulls out his list of 20 questions. Do you know who this is? Do you know? I'm like, I know who that guy is. Yeah, he came. I was at a jam night and this guy is like the biggest dork in the world. You know, he's like, really? Oh my God. In 1965, I saw him and he was swinging from curtains and he was like, well, oh. Not in 1995. Let me say so, but you know, we were joking. Yeah. Somebody comes up to us and goes, uh, gentlemen, BB's only meeting the band leaders and saying hello to them. Would you like to meet BB King and say hello? And Robert's like, Oh yeah. And I'm like, Oh, great. And I was, to me, this was going to be the culmination of his belief in me. Mm -hmm. Um, of, of, we're here overseas playing at a festival with not only him, but with Robert Plant, maybe two of the biggest icons of their respective genres. <laughs> and I'm going to walk in with Robert Plant, and he's going to be like, kid, oh, yeah. Like, so I'm, I'm really excited by it, you know? That's not what happened yeah. at all. So I, I walk in with Robert Plant. He looks at Robert Plant, and then he looks at me. And instead of being happy, he is the has the Biggest scowl, negative look on his face, pop. And he goes, Well, you made it. Nothing more I really can tell you except stay away from drugs. Mm -hmm. Many of my band, uh, musicians in my band, have gone down that road, hasn't ended well for them. And then he turned and he looked at Robert Plant and he gave him the dirty look, and then he was polite. And then I left so deflated, thinking, wow, BB was kind of mean. I've never seen him like that. Yeah. Oh, that was, I, I thought he'd be happy. That, and I only realized, with age and experience, that he was actually trying to protect me. That he mm -hmm. thought that I might be hanging out with somebody who many years prior had a history of excess and and, and he was just, and who knows, probably beat it, beat it, he was holding back with him in 1969 in New York or something. But um, he probably realized that uh, he was being protective. And, you know, 
and we had many encounters after that. But yeah, that was just a crazy thing. And hold on, let me see. Uh, okay, here we got a prop. Here is a treasured photo. Wow. Taken by Robert Plant. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> I have a profound connection to BB in the way that he was so loving and so gracious and so open-minded. Um, and his words have been my battle armor in, in, um, in trying to, in my own way, be inspired by what he did for the blues and expand it and, and do different things with it. And, mm. um, yeah, so, uh, I'm so grateful for, for all those experiences. It's like, yeah, he, he, he was a master in all regards and, and uh, yeah, just so grateful for that. Mm. Obviously, your your latest album, uh, High Voltage Blues, which we touched on, uh, it's topped the, the, uh, the Billboard's blues charts and has remained in that top 10 for eight months. Yes. Uh, it's your eighth consecutive album to crack the top ten and your third number one. Um, I think it's fair to say you're on a bit of a run. What yeah. What's this period been like for you? I mean, just reading that now, it's like that's that's a hell of an achievement. Thank you. Um, it's very strange to be in your early 50s and feel like you're just getting started. <laughs> it's <laughs> The weirdest thing. Um, uh, I, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know how to explain it, but there's a lot of fire. Um, and, and, you know, it, I've had a lot of opportunities for success, but people say, you know, the stars have to align, you know, mm. and I don't think people were ready for the kind of music that I was doing until now. And, um, I, I find it's like a really exciting, Time for just music in general. I think we've accepted where technology is and we've learned to embrace it and expand and utilize it. Um, and at the same time, I feel like there's a renaissance with classic rock and, and, um, uh, there's a lot of bands popping up and, and I think the empire needs new men and, and, and women in it. And, um, I think our, our our music resonates with people who may not listen to blues. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've we've been getting a lot of success because of that. Um, and I'm very grateful. I've uh, you know I've I've had a fan base for 20 years that have helped me keep the lights on, gas in the van to get to the gigs, to live a very modest and humble life, but to live a good one. And I am so grateful to these. Every show, every city we'd show up, there'd be 75 to 100 people. And we'd have enough to get by. And um, now there's two, three, and four, and 500 people. Um, and that's really, that's awesome. You know, when you, you've lived so long in, in a modest way, um, you're almost shocked at success. It's like, you're so used. Um, you know, it's like, well, I, I can actually supersize my fast food thing and not worry about counting the money. You know, it, it's just a really cool, cool thing. Um, and for as long as it goes, I'm happy on this ride. You know, I've been so long uh, at, at the bottom that if I go back there, it's cool. You know, I, I, I'll be happy no matter where, but. Sure, nice ride being up here, you know, <laughs> moving up, you know. Mm. So, uh, yeah, but it, it, it's just really exciting. <laughs> and, you know, humor aside, I, I, I really feel like very fortunate that my life experience is at a place that is peaking with my sense of creativity and, and, and excitement. And um, as an artist, you're aware that every artist you may admire, whether it's a painter or a, you know, recording artist, they have peaks and valleys in their careers. And sometimes 
they have a magical period. Um, and I feel like I'm in the middle <clears throat> of this period. Um, and, and as long as it lasts, I'm grateful, you know, as long as the creativity comes and, and you know, working on new music and, and I feel like uh, that's super, super exciting. Like I really feel the best is yet to come and uh, realizing that you may say that is a PR thing every record you release, but I, it's actually happening now. And and that's a wonderful place. Um, yeah, and 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 uh, so yeah, just a lot of gratitude and a lot of hard work. And I don't know if that's the question you asked, but hey, I completely um, I, I get it, man. I mean. It feels like you've taken quite a, a big step up. Of course, this album guests uh, Billy Sheehan of the Wiry Dogs and Mr. Big and uh, Ray Lugier of uh, Corn. I mean, that's quite that's quite a, a hefty uh, backup there. Um, how did that kind of come about? I mean, obviously, this album this time around is kind of an amalgamation of, of your some of your previous works. Yeah. Um- this is our, uh, we're signed by a label called Rat Pack Records. Mm. And um, they discovered our music. The president of the company, Joe Bryan, was on Amazon Music and listening to Gary Moore. And he said, if you like Gary Moore, check out Anthony Gomes. And he did. And he's like, wow. And he called his friends up and he said, have you ever heard of this guy? And they're like, no, I've never heard of him. Uh, and you know, he realized that we were a blues rock artist being marketed to the blues world. And he said, how would you feel if you were a blues rock artist marketed to the rock world? And I said, sure. I mean, <laughs> uh, whoever would like our music, I'd love them to hear it. And um, so he put together a, a list of songs. We added three new ones. And we re-recorded these songs and we put a sort of a, a twist on them. Um, where I was today, you know, no apologies. This is who we are. Um, and, uh, he arranged, you know, he knew Ray because, uh, Ray's in a band called KXM, Doug Pinnock and George Lynch on the label. And, um, since Ray played with David Lee Roth, he knew Billy through that connection. And, um, you know, next thing you know, I, you know, Hey man, when I was growing up, everybody said the baddest rock bass player was Billy Sheehan. It's like, you know, you didn't want to meet that guy in a dark alley. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, so to have this guy that teenage me would, you know, if I could go back to teenage me and say, guess what? You're actually A, doing music for a living and <laughs> Billy Sheehan is going to be on your album. I- I'd be pretty excited, you know, and, Fast forward to, you know, today, yeah. Um, and talk about nice guys and very supportive and, um, just really, really great guys. And, and, uh, so I didn't know them. That was put together through the label. And, uh, I really enjoyed playing with them because they brought this ferocious rock aspect that allowed me to play more bluesy of all things. Because they were covering so much space. And, um, it reminded me of, you know, Cream, where you have Joe Baker and Jack Bruce that were very busy. And Eric was always playing these licks, you know, these awesome blues licks. And I felt like I could play some of those licks for the first time, like, like, like some of my favorite Cream inspired riffs, because these guys were like, it was a fire, you know, underneath and I could just, Simmer on top. So it was, it was a, a very cool experience. Mm. I mean, do, do you feel that they've kind of, that they, they almost pushed you? I mean, obviously you've got like some of these songs that you've had in your repertoire for a while. And, you know, I went back and listened to some of the older versions of it and then heard them now. And if it, it feels like everything's been taken up a few gears, you know, like the production, I mean, it sounds bigger. It sounds better it's you know it's kind of it's the best we've ever heard you i think well thank you thank you um well simply put when you have billy sheen and ray leisure on the track <laughs> and suck okay like 
Man, the song's not very good. Uh, I think it was the bass player. <laughs> you can't, you know, you've got two guys that are arguably the best at what they do, right? Mm -hmm. The best in their field. You know, you may have, a, 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 there's nobody better. There might be somebody different, but there's nobody better than these two guys. So, yeah, that may force you to dig a little deeper and, you know, Fear, I found, is a wonderful motivator. <laughs> and, you know, so, um, but you can also get inspired by that, you know, by that little sense of fear, or, or, or what have you. And, uh, yeah, you know, it was great to partner with a label, you know, um, and that gave us the ability to have these guys on the record. Um, Chris Collier mixed the album and, and, you know, to have access to these people and, um, the belief, you know, when the label tells these people, hey, we really believe in this artist, you know, that goes a long way in, in their first impression of you, you know. So, yeah, very, very, uh, very cool thing. Thank you for, for your kind words, too, on the new album. Appreciate it. It's cool. Um, obviously, your, your first album was right back in 1998. Yeah. Has your... Has your process changed over there? I mean, for context, when when that album came out, I think I was about either five or six. <laughs> right. In the nineteen hundreds, yes, when that album came out. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, I had the pleasure of working with a great producer named Jim Gaines, who worked with Stevie Ray Vaughan and Santana. He always said, "Try to make your next album better than the previous." One. Take what you've learned and improve upon that. Use those lessons. Great advice. Um, so after 14 albums, kids, <laughs> maybe you finally get it together. But, you know, uh, so your first album, you don't know anything about it. You know, mm. and there's a certain beauty in being that naive. Um, that if you have the right people around you and the right combination of people around you to help you capture that, um, then some magic can happen. That combination of you not really knowing what you're doing and people around you who do to help shape that. I think it would take a very special 21 or 22 year old person as an independent solo artist to really know what they do. Mm. Um, right off the bat, first album. I mean, I think that maybe Prince might be the only guy or, or whatever, you know, like there's, just because you learn so much with time and mm. you need a bunch of 50 and 60 and year old people around you that, that know something and, and, you know, and then they tell you, Hey, you know, or 40 year olds or whatever. And then, then you go, no, you're wrong. Man. But somehow you find this, this balance, you know, and, and yeah, the cool thing happens. So yeah, I was just jumping in into the deep end 19, 98 and, and hoping for the best you know mm. I, I i think you know the, the, this is the great thing about i mean as you, you mentioned there it's like 40 i mean what was it 14 albums now yeah that you've done yeah. i mean that's to, to do 14 is is quite an achievement in itself i mean i imagine being able to to go through all of these different albums and and have that plethora of experience you know that that leads you to these these moments where you are today, you know, number one in the charts. You know, you've got that experience now, I imagine. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I saw this interview with Paul McCartney, and he was just talking very nonchalantly about the greatness of these Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yeah, you just do this, you have a middle <laughs> age, da -da 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 -da. and and now maybe they learned that from George Martin. You know, um, they, maybe that was the person that that group of brilliant people had that there was that one force. And, and then they had this incredible gift for searching or whatever. Um, I think that's the right combination for success. Um, at a young age, I think at a, if you stay in the game long enough and you get that experience, you still have to maintain that wild eyed, childlike, love and, and willingness to be open-minded um 
and willingness to be close-minded too. Actually, mm -hmm. I think if you get, um, you know, when I was in high school, I was like Madonna sucks, I hate oh horrible. Now you know, I'm like, wow, what great production. Oh, you know, but you're making on this song is incredible. You know, who played drums on this track? You, you know, you sort of become a little bit more uh, understanding, and the world becomes a lot more gray. Mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes holding on to a little bit of black and white is 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 good for your art. You know, it's like that childlike, you know. Um, I, I don't know. It's almost, uh, you have to temper it, but it's almost this belief that you know better and, um, and very <laughs> judgmental sometimes. You know, you have to temper that, but a little bit of, you know, one slice of cheese on the burger is okay, you know, um, of, of having that, that youthful bravado. Mm. Uh, a question I always like to to finish on. I ask every guest that comes on. Uh, I mean, you you've obviously toured with quite a few people over the years, but uh, if if you could tour with one band or musician from the past and one from the present, who would they be? Uh, 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 uh. Everybody struggles with this one. Everybody, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everybody goes, <laughs> "Oh my your God. way of torturing people." <laughs> On the way out, you, yeah, because you know everyone who's answered this question four hours later is going to go, oh, yeah. God. everybody goes, oh, it's that one. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Um, to tour with, so not to play with, but but just. Well, I mean, it could be, yeah. So you could either join them on stage, you could just tour with them, be on like a double billing. I mean, it's your. That you're in control, like you call the shots on this tour, so like you can turn okay. up whenever you want. <laughs> All right. I, well, I probably will, would prefer to be on a double bill because I'd most likely be too intimidated to be. Uh, uh, well, Jimi Hendrix mm. dead. Um, I might have said BB King, but I I've had that life experience. So, yeah. um, Jimi Hendrix to me sort of. The OG, you know, he's the guy that, that wrote the book on all of that. Um, yeah. Uh, Jim Hendrix or Otis Redding, you know, I probably okay. have to say one or, one or two of those. And current, <laughs> current, mm -hmm. current. I can I can see you really thinking that. I mean, you've got what appears to be a rival son's shirt on there. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah. <laughs> what's, what's, my, what's my favorite newer newer acts? Rival son, uh, the Struts. You know, I love all those bands. Um, is is this a creative thing, like a purely creative choice, like some band that I would admire, or am I? Oh, I got this. Paul McCartney. There we mm. go. Sir Paul. We'll we'll get booed off the stage as the opening act. But I mean, uh, there's not a bigger rock star alive today, in my humble opinion. Um, he's playing stadiums. That could be a really good thing. Um, yeah. you know, uh, from a pragmatic point of view. Plus, he's a Beatle. Like you know, um again, these these guys were the architects, Hendrix and Paul McCartney. Um so uh yeah, I was yeah I was trying to think of some like crazy, like Adele. You know some what I mean? Wild choice. Well, wild choice. Like you know, <laughs> <laughs> she she's a you know sensitive artist, female fan base. Mm -hmm. You know we're hell raising, whiskey drinking, fist pumping. <laughs> you know, eighty percent male audience. You know, like that. Go, come out and play white trash princess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see, you know, see what happens. Major things have happened, right? <laughs> so, um, I, I think that 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 could be interesting. You know, she's a wonderful singer, and I know we would share a love of Eddie James. So, uh, there there would be some common ground there. Uh, but uh, yeah, that <laughs> <could> be exciting. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, there, there, there are some interesting choices there. I mean, um, thank you very much for joining me, uh, Anthony. And uh, obviously, for those that want to go out and grab this uh, this hit uh, new album, uh, High Voltage Blues, um, you can get that uh, via the link in the description below. Um, see how much longer we can keep you in the charts. Yeah. And, uh, how are we going to get to the end of the year and we're going to be staying in the top 10 do you reckon well <laughs> let's start off by saying this 38 weeks unless you're a legacy act like bonnie mm. ranger or buddy guy is unprecedented so mm. somebody i think prior to this my length on the charts was five weeks mm. okay that, i mean and that was a good run so now we're 35 weeks that's tough, man. That's like pretty like and now so you know I'll post it on Facebook and then the fans are like, 52 weeks, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about 36 weeks? But, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll be riding, man, we'll be riding the train as long as it's chugging down the track and and mm. I'm so grateful for it. I mean, it's crazy to think that 35 weeks on the charts and this week we're in the fifth biggest album. In, in the country, you know, mm. the highest selling album. So, uh, in, in the blue genre. So, wow, that's pretty, uh, pretty awesome. So, let, let, yeah, let's see. Hey, everybody, get the record. Let's, <laughs> this is it. let's see how long we can do it. I think I, that's I, I the like challenge. the challenge. Yeah, I like your style, <laughs> man. Let's do it. <laughs> well, thank you very much.